Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed. I'm Arjuna and this is the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. Today I've got a discussion between Michael Cramo and Erica, who runs the YouTube channel Guts at Gibbon. Michael Cramo is the author of Forbidden Archaeology. And we'll get straight into it. There are, there's a description of the guests in the bio if you want to know more. And we'll start by handing it over to Michael Cramo. So Michael and Erica, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks. Good to be here. And uh, Michael, maybe you could just quickly introduce yourself and then we can get, get right get into your presentation. It's about 15 minutes each for the presentation and then, then we'll have open discussion. Cool. Okay. Well, my name is Michael Cremo. I'm uh, a researcher in human origins and antiquity. I've published some books Forbidden Archaeology, Hidden History of the Human Race, Human Devolution, A Vedic Alternative to Darwin's Theory, and some others. So I'm happy to be here today to discuss ideas about human origins and antiquity with Erica. You want me to go too, Arjuna? Or oh, yeah, you sure. Wanna... Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, you could quickly introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can wait until my presentation. I don't mind. I'm easy. Oh, I might as well. Um, yeah, okay. okay. Well, um, yeah, I'm Erica uh, Gutsy Gibbon on YouTube. Um, I am currently a PhD candidate for biological anthropology, and I specialize in primatology, so extant or still living primates. I got my master's degree. Uh, it was a master's of research in primate biology, behavior, and conservation. Um, so, so I really enjoy talking about uh, human evolution and human origins. And I, while I know Michael and I disagree, um, I, I know we're going to have a very fun time having this discussion. So I'm excited to be here. Cool. All right. And then, Michael, you could start with your presentation. Okay. Uh, I'd like, first of all, to clarify what my claim actually is. So one thing to understand about me is that I represent myself in the world of archaeology as a person who is approaching the discipline of archaeology from the standpoint of another knowledge tradition. So the, the path of my life led me, I won't go through all the boring details, but let's say it just led me to the spiritual tradition of ancient India, which has a a different epistemology than that followed by modern science today. Uh, you know, for example, there's a reliance on on uh, statements from holy scripture, sacred writings. For example, the Puranas, which are the cosmological or historical writings of ancient India. And they describe a very ancient human presence on this planet. So I began to look into archaeology, which is the science that deals with human origins. You could also say uh, physical anthropology, evolution, other words, but archaeology is one of the main disciplines. And I found uh, that actually there was some evidence consistent with what the Puranas tell us about human origins and antiquity. So I, uh, with a, a a scientist who was a co-religionist of mine, Richard Thompson, we wrote a book called Forbidden Archaeology. It's about 900 pages long. And it's uh, <clears throat> it was too long for some people, so we brought it out in a shorter edition as well, Hidden History of the Human Race. Uh, Putting, putting together the case that we wanted to make. Now, that book was published in 1993. 
And at that time, I started uh, representing the substance of the book, giving talks on it to different audiences. And one of my audiences is the professional scientific community, particularly the archaeologists and anthropologists. And I had to study that field because I'm approaching it, as I said, from a, a different point of view, a knowledge tradition that's not recognized. And I found that among archaeologists, there are basically two groups. One I call the archaeology group. The other I call the archaeologies, plural, group. And you know, for example, this is uh, the journal of the World Archaeological Congress, one of the uh, largest international organizations of archaeologists. And the title of their journal is Archaeologies. <clears throat> and in the journal, in their description of the kinds of papers that they uh, would like to receive, uh, they point out that they're very interested in hearing about non-Western epistemologies and intellectual traditions. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm not entering the world of archaeology as a PhD archaeologist, a professor, I'm entering from another tradition. And uh, what I would do, and what I have done for a few decades now, is present another, the perspective of another knowledge system on their topic. Why am I doing that? Because some of them are inviting such participation, like in this, they're calling for it. Uh, they, so the, the archaeology group believes that there's one objective science of archaeology, and that's it. Those in the archaeology's group you could say maybe influenced by most more postmodern concepts, concepts of decolonization and so on. So they're very interested in hearing alternative presentations from non-Western epistemologies and others. So uh, my claim is for that group of people is that there is some value in looking at evidence from different points of view. And maybe from that different point of view, one might analyze the total body of evidence, uh, not just the body of evidence that's uh, being cited by a dominant consensus group in archaeology or any other science. And this gets you into some issues connected with the philosophy of science, like Thomas Kuhn's concept of paradigms in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where he proposed, if there's no paradigm in a science, then all of the evidence that comes to one's attention is equally relevant. But once you have a paradigm, once you have an established methodology and uh, certain well-developed theories with a body of evidence that supports that, then uh, you tend to have some, make some discrimination that this fits and this doesn't fit. Uh, and the things that don't fit are called anomalies. Uh, now, what might be an anomaly for, from one, the perspective of one paradigm may not be 
and anomaly from a the perspective of another. And here again, I'm kind of influenced by uh, philosophers of science like Paul Feyerabend, who proposed that it's really necessary sometimes to look from outs an outside perspective uh, at a research community or uh, uh, scientific discipline. So uh, that's what I've proposed to do. And in the course of that, I've presented many papers at mainstream conferences of archaeology, such as the World Archaeological Congress and European Association of Archaeologists. And I found that some of them are quite interested in an alternative perspective. So what I basically am proposing to them is that if one looks, as I have, at not just the discoveries that are cited in today's textbooks, but if you look at the whole history of archaeology, you can find credible reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity. Uh, so I've collected those and I've presented them at conferences and sometimes my uh, papers are published like Quranic time in the archaeological record was published in this uh, uh, volume edited by archaeologist Tim Murray. Uh, he was he, he took a paper that I presented at a session on time and archaeology in a, a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress and published it in this book which is uh, an academic series put out by Rutledge. It's called One World Archaeology. And, you know, some of there are many others <clears throat> you know, I could cite for you. Uh, and <clears throat> my works have been reviewed extensively by archaeologists, and some of them... <clears throat> Uh, I'm not claiming that they completely endorse everything that I say, but they even the, the, some critics, some of my heaviest critics, they find some value in the work. Like Tim Murray said, well, in his review, which was published in British Journal for History of Science, said uh, th this this would be excellent material for uh, a study in the history and philosophy of science, provide really good examples uh, for questioning the epistemology of the discipline. So, of course, he didn't agree with, with me, but you know, he, he said, well, at least th that's, you know, if, you know, as far as a Vedic perspective of the kind that Michael Cremo is proposing, well, that's up to the individual scientists to decide whether or not. And I think that's a, a, a good attitude uh, that <clears throat> now there's other other groups in the world of archaeology that really don't like to hear me. They don't think I should be invited to conferences. They don't think my thing should be published. There are plenty of those. But this other group, what I, which I call the archaeologies group, is pretty widespread and has some position in the archaeological community. And they are willing to listen at least. So I, I think that's uh, very important. How am I doing on time, Arjun? 
Okay, maybe I've got a few more minutes. Oh, oh sorry, I was muted. Just... Um, I'm not keeping strip time, but maybe another five minutes, or d depending how, okay. how how Eric is feeling about it too. Oh, I'm easy. Yeah. I I'm good to go. Okay, uh, so my contention is that if we look at the archaeological record from different points of view, epistemological points of view, that one may interpret or read the evidence in a way that is not exactly the same as today's current dominant consensus group in archaeology would analyze it. Uh, they, 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 they might say, well, th th that's just too old. It doesn't really fit uh, and find some reason to dismiss a case. But then, you know, a few years later, when their ideas have changed a little bit, a discovery like that may become meaningful. So my contention is that <clears throat> I'm helping archaeologists keep the entire data set relevant to their field of study in view. And just because at one point in time in the history of a science, some evidence doesn't fit and it's dismissed, that doesn't mean it should be cast into oblivion because in the light of future discoveries may mean something. So uh, I'll give some examples, uh, just two examples of the kind of evidence that I'm talking about. And uh, because I'm taking the approach of looking at the entire history of archaeology, looking at all the discoveries that have been made and not just the ones that are currently used to support the current dominant theories. Say if we look into the early history of archaeology, we find discoveries like the California gold mine discoveries made in the uh, 19th century by uh, miners who were digging tunnels into the Sierra Nevada mountains. And deep inside the tunnels, the miners were finding human artifacts and human bones in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are about 50 million years old. These discoveries came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California, and he wrote a massive report on them uh, that was published by Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology in 1880. And he extensively documented these discoveries. Now, they weren't accepted because they didn't fit the dominant theory. There was a physical anthropologist, William Holmes, working at the Smithsonian Institution, who said in a, a report that he published in uh, a Smithsonian Institution annual report, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution as it's developed today, he would have hesitated to announce those conclusions despite the imposing array of evidence and testimony with which he was confronted. So uh, therefore, these discoveries are hardly ever, almost never mentioned today, even to debunk them. Uh, so my contention would be, well, uh, you may not like it now, but it's part of the entire data set, uh, and you should keep it in mind. So a more recent example of a thing like that is some discoveries that were made at Ulduvai Gorge in 2015, there was a, a team of archaeologists led by 
uh, Manuel Dominguez Rodrigo and his colleagues. And they discovered at Buldavai Gorge a human finger bone. And they published a report about it in Nature Communications in 2015. So it's a recognized scientific publication. And in their report, they said uh, they took this human finger bone, they measured it, not just with a ruler or something, but you know, they did very exacting measurements of the bone. And then they used uh, very complex statistical analysis to compare the shape of the bone to the shape of the same finger bone, it's like this one here, the proximal phalanx. Uh, they analyzed it very carefully, compared it to the same finger bone in uh, known species of apes, monkeys, gibbons, baboons, and they also compared it with fossil hominins, Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. And they also compared it with a sample of anatomically modern human finger bones, the same one. And they found it fit in the modern human group. It was different from that of the apes and monkeys. It was different from that of... Uh, the hominins like Australopithecus and Homo erectus. And they said in their report, now what was really interesting is that this was found in a very well studied deposit at Uduvai Gorge that was 1.8 million years old, 1,840,000 years old. And they concluded, well, this finger bone is most anatomically similar to modern Homo sapiens. But obviously, we can't call it Homo sapiens because of its geological age of 1.84 million years old. So uh, now looking at it from a different perspective, uh, and taking it, taking into account the Vedic or Puranic accounts of extreme human antiquity, one might look at that and say, well, why not? Why can't it be called Homo sapiens? Uh, you could say, well, because there's no evidence for that. But if your reason for rejecting something is that it doesn't fit, uh, I think there's a problem there. But the main thing is that I, I think there is some value for looking at things from different perspectives through different time lenses. And there are, there's some fraction of the uh, professional community of archeologists that is interested in hearing such things. So that's what my claim is. Cool. All right. Thanks cool. for that. Right. Thanks oh, for that. oh, oh. you're asking. I don't know why I'm echoing. <laughs> oh, did it stop? Okay. It did. It did stop. Okay. I don't know what that was. Okay. I'm streaming with a different setup today. So you'll notice there's no audio sync issues. You can see the lips moving at the same time that you hear the sound. So. Um, that's a new setup using OBS Ninja. Um, so thanks for that, Michael. Uh, and Erica, could you please give us your response? Uh, 15 minutes or so. We're not strictly timing it. Hold on. Let me get this screen share oh, under control here. Screen share. 
All right. Can you guys see this? Yes. Oops. Yes. Okay. Now I can see. Awesome. It. Perfect. Okay. So. Oh, hang on. Begin. I've got to add it to the stream, but you could just you you can get you get started. Um, oh yeah. I mean, I just you know I I can just get started. Well, actually, while you're pulling it into the stream, let me set up my timer so I can keep an eye on where I'm at. So yeah. I don't. Sometimes I I. I, I Ran short earlier when I timed myself, so I might take a little bit of more time to, you know, <laughs> monologue on things. Um, okay, so I'm going to start my timer now. Is that cool? Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, so human evolution and the antiquity of Homo sapiens. Now, when I'm talking about the antiquity of Homo sapiens, and um, Michael and I can discuss this maybe later in the open discussion, but I'm referring to anatomically modern Homo sapiens rather than, say, archaic Homo sapiens or, or sister hominins, etc., so what does the conventional science say? Human evolution is supported by every relevant field, but the most prominent are genetics, comparative morphology, paleontology, geology, primatology, and physics. And of course, subsets of those species do the same. Humans, homo sapiens, are animals that are, of course, uh, part of a long lineage of hominins, hominids, catarines, anthropoids, haplorines, and primates that extend back probably over 50 million years. That's a very long time. Today, we're primarily going to be discussing all of this in the context of the fossil record, as I'm hoping to, I am an in-training biological anthropologist, which in my opinion, beautifully displays the slow morphologic change over geologic time. So I'm going to address some of Michael's large contentions um, before delving into the hominins themselves. Um, I like Michael a lot, he seems really sweet, uh, but I am going to critique his work a bit here. So I, I hope that it's very clear that my opinions of, of perhaps what's in hidden histories does not reflect on my opinion of Michael. I think he's a cool guy. So I wanna steal man his position first. Um, Michael would perhaps say that biological anthropology is a science that is rife with data suppression, both intentional and accidental. These are the impressions that I was getting from hidden history. Uh, this is found in the form of the burial, pun intended, of proposed data points such as out-of-time tools, out-of-time art, and out-of-time skeletal material. When I say out-of-time, I just mean finding them where they would, according to the paradigm, not be supposed to be found, as well as an artificial confidence attributed to later hominin finds that are accepted in conventional science. Michael perhaps feels that the data of hominin paleontology, when taken as a whole, supports anatomically modern humans living essentially all through time, um, I would imagine according to sort of the, this uh, Vedic view, from the Miocene to the Cretaceous and earlier. This is proposed, of course, as an alternative to recent human evolution from other apes. So here are my thoughts on hidden history. Unfortunately, I think it's out of date. Um, Michael said himself this text was written in the mid-1990s. Um, and for that time period, per perhaps it was it was quite good. Um, but there's been quite a bit that's gone down in paleoanthropology since then. Uh, in the text, he covers things like incised bones, eoliths, out-of-time culture, out-of-time homo sapiens remains. And uh, I have this section called Conventional Science versus Michael on hominins. So... Let's talk about the incised bones and eoliths first. For those of you who may not know, incised bones are of course pieces of bone with intentional hash marks on them, maybe by some kind of critter cutting them with some kind of tool. And an eolith is a stone tool. It means dawn stone. So in a similar fashion with incised bones in, in hidden histories, the eolith examples are all quite old. The, majoring, the overwhelming majority rather in hidden history are from the 1800s. Uh, Michael seems to present these as if they are indicative of like a broader cover-up, as if these finds have been perhaps suppressed and hidden away to avoid rocking the boat. However, this does not appreciate the indescribable amount of work that has been done on lithics and tools. Um, this work is how the eoliths, or intentionally made stone tools, became downgraded to geofacts, or naturally formed worked stones. And the reason that this sort of occurred is because these eoliths were being found by, by many different very, very early forms of anthropologists, as it were, who were finding them in places like the Miocene, where we would only have um, like apes, Miocene apes. Uh, Michael notes a handful of these early studies uh, in Hidden History, uh, Boole 1905 and Warren 1905, but this is the tip of the iceberg. I've included here some of the recent works on lithics versus geofacts, and it's important to note that these studies include hands-on experimentation in order to parse the man-made from the natural. I agree with Michael in the sense that we should never discard a piece of data simply because it doesn't fit with the paradigm. I think that that is unacceptable. However, these eoliths that are proposed in, in histories, many 
of them have been considered by conventional anthropology and they have been rejected not on the basis of reject of the of uh, uh, challenging the paradigm but on the basis of violating experimental work um, showing that they were indeed formed naturally rather than rather than by hands and what that essentially means is they lack many of the proper fracture marks or fracture lines rather um, striking weights things like that oops uh, but Michael, in my opinion, faces some more methodological issues because these incised bones and eoliths um, are probably naturally created. I read some of the some of the um, papers that I just listed, and and they're quite robust. But even if they weren't, even if none of that work had been done, more parsimonious explanations exist for these eoliths and incised bones rather than anatomically modern humans living in the Miocene. The tools perhaps could have been worked by Mycene apes because they're very similar things like um, Paralopithecus, Dryopithecines, they're very similar to modern apes who use numerous types of tools, both stone and other organic material, to accomplish tasks. They could also be a part of reworked strata. That's going to be a big point that I'm going to make a lot here. Uh, this is why in situ documentation or actual documentation of the, of the thing when it's still concreted in the ground is so important, methodologically speaking. It's effectively mandatory in modern paleontology. You can't just report that you found a bone and not take a picture of it when it's still concreted in the ground. Um, so out of time culture. Once again, the examples in hidden history are presented as these incredibly old um, are presented are incredibly old. They're all from the 1800s and the majority are lost. So the majority of, of what Michael's presented in hidden history can no longer be analyzed. Uh, in the case of many of them, such as the Nampa figurine, intentional hoaxing is strongly supported. Uh, the Nampa figurine is, when, when some of the local anthropologists were looking at it, it's effectively indistinguishable from the toys that local Native American populations use. Uh, other examples, such as the marble letters, are quite possibly examples of uh, simulacrum. So it's... We'll talk about that in just a moment. But much like the other eoliths, there's potential for reworked rock in a lot of these as well, which again is why in situ documentation is important, but it's never been presented for, for many of these sort of fringe finds. Uh, these are examples of simulacrum, right? So it's something that looks like it was man-made, but is not. Uh, to the left, you can see um, a, compar a comparison rather of a very early picture taken of a mountain on Mars, um, and then a more high-def picture. The first one, it went viral because people thought it was an intentionally crafted human face made perhaps by extraterrestrials. Um, lo and behold, it's, it's just a mountain. Um, the Giant's Causeway in the north of the UK is very similar. I wouldn't blame anyone from looking at this and thinking that a human had done it, but we know very well the processes, geologically speaking, behind formations such as the Giant's Causeway. And when we know that a natural process is available and it does clash with the paradigm, um, it's really an Occam's razor kind of situation unless those who are challenging the paradigm bring more to the table. Uh, in this case, this would be something like in situ documentation. So out of time, Homo sapiens remains. Some of these out of time Homo sapiens remains, that is Homo sapiens being found where they shouldn't be found, quote unquote, um, have been further scrutinized since sort of they were initially found. The Galley Hill skeleton or Castanodolo remains have been further scrutinized uh, and by numerous radiometric dating methods, they were shown to have lived very recently and not in the Middle Pleistocene as originally proposed by the finders. Of course, the Middle Pleistocene would be far too old for an anatomically modern human to be found, um, which is why they were scrutinized more. And it turns out that they were in reworked strata. Others like the Fox Hall draw, uh, Fox Hall draw, sorry, lacked in situ documentation. Um, and others still like the Macopan coal skeleton, which is this full skeleton that was supposedly found in carboniferous coal, exists only in a report. The skeleton itself has, has vanished, so we, we actually can't assess it uh, any further. And the original find itself was also again in the, in the late 1800s, I believe, um, which is not a time period when we could use uh, effectively things like absolute dating. Um, there are missing hominins from hidden history. Uh, like I said, I don't really, I don't really Think that Michael is to blame for this because he, of course, wrote the wrote the book rather in the mid 1990s. Uh, that, but that being said, it it should be noted that Sahelanthropus chinensis, Aurorantugenensis, Artipithecus rabidus, and Artipithecus cadaba, Kenyanthropus platyops, Australopithecus sediba, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo gautengensis, most Homo erectus specimens, including the Dimenisi skulls, Homo floresiensis, Homo naledi, Homo heidelbergensis, and Denisovans are missing. Um, and this is important because this is like two thirds of the hominins that we know. These incredibly well bolster human evolution because what they show is slow morphologic change over geologic time. Now, there is some contemporaneity with some of these guys, uh, and that's because when a species 
has a branch off of the new population that then sort of takes on a new morphologic form and evolves, that doesn't necessitate that the former population goes extinct. However, what we should see overall is a trend of, of fitter traits surviving. And in this case, we're seeing human evolution uh, from, say, Helanthropus through Ardipithecus ramidus all throughout the Australopithecines um, up into early Homo erectus, some of which are called Homo georgicus and Homo ergaster, um, through early Genus Homo and Homo heidelbergensis, Neanderthalensis, uh, up through archaic Homo sapiens and modern Homo sapiens. Uh, and it's important, of course, to realize that these are separated again by geologic time, which is a, a prediction made by evolution. Um, I don't have a problem at all with people challenging the paradigm, but if you're going to overturn something as robust as human evolution, I, I think you've got to have more to bring to the table. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of these guys. I'm going to skip my favorite hominins, which are, of course, the Miocene apes, because um, Michael doesn't cover them in Hidden History, uh, and I'd rather stick to kind of what he's covered. So we have innumerable specimens from over 300 individuals of genus Australopithecus. Um, this wealth of skeletal material has allowed us to broadly see how Australopithecines looked, how each species is unique from one another, and how they're different from prior and later hominins. So what you can see here is um, the, the MH1 and MH2 specimens. So these are Australopithecus sediba. They are definitively bipedal animals with a brain case size that is about in between um, Homo erectus and chimpanzees, or say Helanthropus chinensis. Um, I want to correct some things I saw in Hidden History from the perspective of a biological anthropologist. Um, one, one of the things that Michael mentions is that neoteny is what links, wh what tells us that Australopithecines were just another ape. Um, and they are just another ape in the same way that humans are just another ape. This retained neoteny is something that uh, begins sort of in the Australopithecines, uh, but is very, very strong in humans. So what you can see over here is all three from modern chimpanzees, uh, Australopithecus africanus, the tongue child, and uh, an infant human, we see these very neonatal features. Humans retain them much more into their adulthood. Australopithecines do a little, and chimps don't really do it at all. Uh, so this is a, a prediction that has been sort of uh, fulfilled by evolutionary theory. Um, the Laetoli footprints is another thing. Yes, I I've talked with a lot of creationists about the Laetoli footprints. Yes, they do look quite like modern human footprints. That's what the people who saw them thought. Unfortunately, at that time, the biological anthropological community was still up in arms on whether or not large brains evolved first or bipedality evolved first in, in the human lineage. This is because we didn't have as many fossils as we do today, not by a long shot. Since then, a ton of work has been done on the Laetoli footprints, and what they reveal is the bipedal gait mechanics, the biomechanics uh, of the Laetoli footprint makers are different from modern humans and chimpanzees, and that they belong to something that is very intermediate to the two. It was definitely a biped, there's no knuckle marks or anything like that, but it bears its weight on its heels and on um, the, the surface of its foot, more like a chimpanzee. Um, this is precisely what we would expect from something that evolved from um, a more basal ape-like animal that was slowly becoming bipedal. Um, this is an in-situ picture of Homo, or Homo, of Australopithecus sediba. This is what we expect from the eoliths. This is what I would need to see. This is what the biological community would need to see if you were showing that you found a human skeleton in the Carboniferous. You would need something like this. Documentation of an in situ organism where it's not supposed to be. But that's not what we find. It's always in reworked rock. It's always uh, only shown and brought to light after it's been excavated, things like that. So how intermediate were the Australopithecines? Um, very intermediate. They had a brain case around 350 to 555 cc's. Chimps, for instance, have about 350. Um, they had an intermediate palate with derived dentition, intermediate hands that were useful for both grasping and, this is very important, manipulation. They had a semi-precision grip. They had derived lower limbs, uh, a very bull-shaped pelvis like a human. Um, you look at that picture right there. Lucy, which is also the afarensis, is that pelvis is practically indistinguishable from Homo sapiens. Um, basal upper limbs and face. And most importantly, they're found geologically intermediate from Ardipithecus to genus Homo. Um, Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. Uh, what are these guys? What are these guys like? How intermediate are they? Very intermediate. Uh, their brain case size is intermediate from Australopithecines to Homo erectus. They have derived hands and derived lower limbs, a derived pelvis. They were definitely bipedal. These guys biomechanically couldn't have been quadrupeds any more than Australopithecines could or we could. Um, but they have basal upper limbs and basal body proportions. They still have very long arms. And they're found geologically intermediate from Australopithecines to genus Homo. Um, Hominins, Homo erectus, Java man. So Homo erectus is also definitively a hominin. Um, that is the uh, the um, Narikotomi boy right there. 
also known as Turkana boy. Uh, they're terrestrial bipedal, very large brain case size uh, with a large range because we're not sure whether we're going to lump or split them up from uh, Homo georgicus, Homo ergaster, and Homo erectus or not. We have dozens of specimens of Homo erectus and Java man remains are indeed characteristic of Homo erectus specimens. I have to make a correction from uh, hidden history because despite being a common misconception and one that is repeated in hidden history, uh, Eugene Dubois never retracted his opinion that Java Man was a human ancestor. I've included some of his notes. They're in Dutch, uh, but I got them from Missing Links, Eugene Dubois and Origins of Paleoanthropology from Shipman and Storm 2002. And this is later in his life, again, still placing um, still placing Java Man as what he was calling at the time Picanthropus. So um, he did think that his find was reminiscent of a giant gibbon. Although he didn't think it was a giant gibbon, he supposed that ancient gibbons were potentially a human ancestor. So if this was a missing link, it should have giant gibbon traits as well as human traits. Um, so what should we see if, if Michael is right? This is an important question to ask because again, I, I agree with Michael, we should never omit data. Every data point needs to be considered. But if Michael is correct, the hypothesis that should be made here is we should find the ubiquity of Homo sapiens, remains, and tools throughout the geologic column. We don't see this despite paleontologists scouring every geologic period each and every day, looking for things like dinosaurs in the Cretaceous or, you know, um, um, placoderms in the Devonian or Eurypterygians in the Ordovician. We, we still, we don't find stone tools and we don't find human remains. So in my opinion, all that's left is a mixture of, a mixture rather of hearsay accounts, um, hoaxes, and honest mistakes from the 1800s, a period which conveniently lacked the technology to confirm or deny extreme human antiquity. Why is it that we're not finding these things anymore? It's not because we're not looking for them. We're looking in all the right places. We just aren't finding them because every time we do, it's reworked um, or, or it's a geofact. So conclusion, human evolution is supported by every relevant field and hi hidden history, in my opinion, proposes out of time tools, art and human remains, but not one example is supported with in situ documentation or recent work. Many hominins are also missing from hidden history and criticism of included of included hominins in hidden history is either out of date or, in my opinion, inaccurate. So I hope we can discuss some of this because I know I've said a lot and Michael said a lot, too. And I'm really looking forward to, to kind of hashing this out in, in a fun uh, and civil way. Yes. Oh, thanks so, for that. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, lots of points there. So, uh, Michael, you can just take it, take whichever points you yeah, want. Yeah, however you want to go, whichever way we want to go. Yes. So, <clears throat> of course, that's Hidden History is one book that I wrote. Mm. There are others like Human Devolution, where I... Uh, deal with other hominins, genetic evidence, and so on and so forth. Mm. And in a book that I've just finished the, writing the manuscript for, I deal with these questions uh, of all the different hominin species, or at least most of them that, mm. you, that you mentioned. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to point out that ideas do change in anthropology, even mm -hmm. biological anthropology, and even the mainstream consensus changes. And it, I see that it's been changing in the direction that was pointed out in Forbidden Archaeology. Uh, for one thing, uh, in the 1990s, when I wrote Forbidden Archaeology, the mainstream consensus was that anatomically modern humans first came into existence 100,000 years ago. The next decade, the 2000s, the mainstream consensus was that anatomically modern humans have been around for 200,000 years. And now, uh, on the basis of, of some discoveries that were made in the past couple of years in Morocco at a site there, they are now saying that anatomically modern humans have been around for 300,000 years. It's so, it, it, as, as a quick correction there before you continue, just in okay. case, um, it, it isn't 
It isn't anatomically modern humans that have been extended to 300,000 years. Um, it's archaic to anatomically modern humans. Now, archaic humans are, are very difficult to distinguish from Homo heidelbergensis, but it can be done by diagnostic characteristics. So that is, again, that, that's in support of, of human evolution. The idea would be, okay, we find these anatomically modern humans, and then the first hominid found was, I believe, Homo uh, neanderthalensis, Ninjaba man, Homo erectus, etc. And as those blanks fill in, what you should see is a smooth gradient. We aren't finding anatomically modern humans 300,000 years ago. We're finding humans that are very archaic compared to the 200,000 years ago and the 100,000 years ago. The traits are changing. So it's not, it's not, they're the same species, but species is an arbitrary definition anyways. What, I, what we're seeing is a great that, that is absolutely correct. Oops. And I would point out that there, there are those in the, community of scholars that we're talking about that do characterize it as anatomically modern human. Uh, so that's my point was, is that the trend is pushing anatomically modern humans further and further back in time. Now, I admit it's uh, quite a big step from there to several million years. Uh, another thing uh, is that many of the characteristics that are used to differentiate archaic uh, Homo sapiens and uh, Homo erectus from anatomically modern humans are actually found in some living populations or recently living populations. Uh, for example, the skull shape, the existence of uh, uh, eyebrow ridges that go like a bar completely across the head, a low forehead and other things. There, there, there are some, I would agree with that, but there are also diagnostic traits that do not, that do not exist. Um, uh, um, simultaneously across these organisms. So the first and foremost would be would be a true chin. So a receding chin versus a true chin versus no chin at all. These things are very distinct. A, a receding chin is not the same thing as lacking a chin of, of having an actual prognathic muzzle. Uh, these these are of course morphometric measurements that that are very very tight, and we don't see any kind of chin showing up more than, I think, 150,000 years ago. Archaic sapiens starts having um, a reduction, but Neanderthals have no chins. Uh, Homo heidelbergensis has no chin. Um, Homo erectus has no chin. You're right. The, the brow ridges can change, but the kind of superorbital ridge or brow ridge that we're seeing in the likes of Homo erectus versus some of the derived populations of humans, modern populations of humans, it's mm -hmm. night and day. Having a ridge like the types that we see in modern humans, while they can be impressive, are nothing compared to what we're seeing in something like Homo heidelbergensis, which is, it's defined partially by that massive, sorry, excuse me, massive bar, uh, but also things like retromolar gaps, uh, cusps on the dentition, um, the actual shape of the back of the skull, which is quite long in, in something like Homo neanderthalensis, but is very globular and vaulted in Homo sapiens. These things are small and they seem unimportant, but that gradient is mapped in accordance with evolutionary theory. There isn't, oh, it's not wild and scattershot as, as some people like to portray, portray it as. Um, it's, it's quite the gradient in, and it's, it's very, very telling in my opinion that we're, what we're looking at. Um, so yes, I, I, well, I would agree that there's variation. It's not to the degree that you would need it to be. And like you said, 300,000 years is a far cry from the Miocene. But it's something, isn't it? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, sure. But I, if you want to say like in, in and of course I, I confess, I've only read Hidden History. So I'm, that's what I'm going off of. So please feel free to correct me. Um, if any of your positions have changed or, or if you have um, a, other support, I suppose, for your position to, to propose. Um, but you propose things like finding footprints in, in, in like the Cambrian in there. Um, and, and to have something like that, wow, that would be insane. Um, and like I said, the, the big key here is that it needs to be, it should be, if your hypothesis is correct, this should be ubiquitous. We should be finding 
very unambiguous stone tools with fracture patterns that that match the lithics that we find um, in in uh, like Uldawan tools and things like that, ubiquitously through the through the geological home and human remains. We find the most fragile, most pristinely preserved fossils of numerous kinds of soft-bodied and hard-bodied organisms all throughout the geologic column. No hominins. No hominins past seven million years. No hominins. So far. So far, that, but we're looking pretty hard. That's recognized by the dominant group in your field of study. Uh, Do you have some that you feel are, are not being appreciated? Um, I've put some of them in forbidden archaeology, but, uh, uh, well, what do you think about the Canem jaw? The Canem jaw, if memory serves that one, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I looked up, uh, all of the ones in hidden history, and while I'm fairly certain the Canem jaw fell into this group in my notes, I'm not sure, I'm not for certain, um, radiometrically dated to young, No? I haven't heard that. That's that. I mean, I might be thinking. I know the foxhole jaw was as well as the, um, mm. as well as the. Oh gosh, I don't know how to pronounce this very yeah. well. You know the one I'm. I mentioned it in my presentation. Hold on, I'm scrolling up right. to it. We're almost there with the um, Castanadolo remains and Galley Hill specimens. Yeah, these these are all specimens that are are carbon dated. Now you mentioned in your in your book, and I hear this from a lot of um, not not Vedic creationists, but young earth creationists, mm -hmm. is that carbon dating is very flawed. And carbon dating can't actually tell you um, the, the age of something that is organic. And carbon dating does have a limit. And in fact, it's when it hovers around that limit of about 50,000 years, that you should start getting very suspicious because that's when contamination is most obvious in experimental circumstances, when contamination is forced or on known contaminated samples, they always check right at that limit. But in the case of the galley skeleton, the foxhole jaw, and if memory serves, um, uh, the, the others as well, a handful of others as well, including the jaw that you're mentioning now, um, we're looking at like 3,000, 5,000, 12,000 years, not, not bussing up against that limit. Um, and I find that compelling. I think that that if you want to make a case as as bold as full on anatomically modern humans living, let's say in the Miocene, let's just let's just stop there at the Miocene. Um, it's got to be unambiguous. I mean, it's being in anthropology, being in paleoanthropology, and seeing what these folks are trying to get published. Seeing what my advise my advisor used to be uh, an editor for the Journal of Human Evolution. Mm -hmm. um, the scrutiny applied even to things that fit in the paradigm is intense. You can't just publish anything. Um, you, you've got to back it up forwards and, and backwards and have all, you know, dot all your I's and cross all your T's or, or they'll just reject you. Um, have you studied the original papers? Some of them, I, uh, most, oh, sorry, I interrupted you, go ahead. No, I mean, what you're saying is true. Everything should be well documented. Hmm. But are you sure that it wasn't well documented, even according to current standards, which of course are always changing anyways, because new technologies and come online, new methods of dating, new methods of interpretation, different fields of study begin to attract more attention than others. Hmm. Yeah, so there, there's... Uh, you know, methods of statistical analysis mm. change. Uh, you know, so you're, you're right. Are That's you, all true. Are you, are you really sure that? And I think the only way to tell is to go back to the original reports, and in light of everything mm. that you said, you know, look at uh, uh, the reports where uh, they document yes in situ finds i you know they're like i'll, I'll give an example in uh, <clears throat> uh, the early 20th century carlos amagino who was a paleontologist and geologist working in argentina he found a toxodon femur <clears throat> Uh, it's an extinct South American mammal. 
And if you look in paleontology database and look at look and find the discoveries, you'll see that it, it came from a species of Toxodon that existed in the Pliocene and Miocene and then went extinct because they haven't found any more of this particular kind of Toxodon since then. So in it, there was a flint arrowhead that had penetrated it and was in it, a flint arrowhead. And arrows are generally the kind of uh, tool or weapon that most anthropologists would say and archaeologists would say are only made by anatomically modern humans. So... It goes, a little, it goes a little further. These days, uh, some folks are giving credence, uh, just as a quick aside, and I'm sorry, I just want to yeah, make sure. No, no, go ahead. Um, I, don't, I don't mind. You know, ne yeah, Neanderthals are capable of making things like knots. They're capable of, of weaving knots for, or ropes, rather, to make knots with. Um, they might have some kind of projectile ability as well. Um, Maybe. Sim si similar, yeah, similar to other, other like, late later hominins, I would say. To underestimate them is is to be unfair to them, in my opinion. So so while I agree, yeah, at the very least, I can certainly agree, yes. If it's an arrowhead, a Miocene ape's not going to make an arrowhead. We can agree on that for certain. Okay. Yeah, and ideas about Neanderthal have changed mm -hmm. a lot over the, over the decades. Um, I think Pat Shipman wrote a... I think hmm. maybe it wasn't her, but... Uh, uh, there was some book about the Neanderthals. The, the, the Invaders. Yeah, Pat Shipman, yeah. The Invader. It's a very, yeah, it's a good book. So the uh, point is that, you know, some anthropologists and geologists and archaeologists in South America were very skeptical of this. Mm -hmm. They say, obviously, what's happened is somebody has come you know they've gotten a, a recent fossil of a toxodon femur they've taken an indian arrowhead and pounded it in and then planted it for amagino to find so uh amagino decided yeah because he had you know he had found it solidly embedded in situ in the Chapad Malolan uh, formation, which is a well-studied formation in on the coast of uh, Argentina. And uh, he decided to get all the critics and leading scientists, geologists to study the strata, paleontologists to study whatever bones or artifacts were found, archaeologists, and he took them to the site. He said, you conduct an excavation. You know, you, you point out a place to dig, and we'll dig there, and you supervise what's going on. So the they did. They went to a, a, the site, and they began digging. And when they were digging, they found boa stones solidly embedded in the Chapad Malolan formation, along with the with bones of extinct mammals. So uh, they photographed it in place. <clears throat> and you know, then they published a report about the geologists documented the layers in which it was found, uh, the different strata at the different levels where it was, showed that it wasn't intrusive, the strata weren't disturbed, photographed in place. But still, uh, it's not mentioned much today, or if, or if it is, it's regarded, uh, as you would say, a, a mistake made by an early generation of, uh, so, and I'm prepared to accept, well, that's true, if it could actually be demonstrated, but 
if I read the original reports, it certainly doesn't seem like that. But, you know, that's, uh, uh, so such things can be found. I don't think one can just assume that, well, it must be a mistake, an illusion. It, it, it's, uh, that, it's right. that, that I agree with. Yeah, to make that assumption is to be unfair. I, I completely agree with that sentiment. And, and that is the sentiment that I, I hope, I hope pervades the, the, um, the methods and the thought process of anyone who considers themselves a scientist. That may not be the case, but I hope I hope that it is that it is indeed there. Yeah. Um, now, my question, I, I don't know, excuse me, I don't know the example that you're talking about, so I can't speak much of it off the top of my head. What I can say is that the examples that I did look into that were indeed very similar, uh, some of these preliminary reports um, discuss in situ finds at the site finds, uh, but the problem with them is that when they're discussing these these in situ finds, none of the ones that I found had photographs. So I'd love to see the one that you're talking about here. If it's got photographs of it, that's awesome. And I'd love to see more recent work done at the site to see what kinds of, of geologic processes these areas have undergone. Because in the case of, um, let me pull it up so that I can give you the right name because you, you mentioned it. In the case of the uh, Castanadolo remains, right, this, this skull that's yeah. being found in, in the Miocene, or mid Pleistocene, mid Pleistocene, I think it is actually. Um, the dead, Pleistocene, pl mid Pleistocene, mid yes. So the, the, the dead giveaway that this thing was an intrusion wasn't actually the strata that it was found in, right? It was plain to be in situ, but in situ can occasionally, especially in some of these older schools, include reworked rock. Um, usually, in situ refers to like it, it has to involve like concretion today. Um, I don't know when that change happened, or maybe it, it was always the case, and, and what I was looking at was was um, was was a mistake or something along those lines. But it was actually the nitrogen analysis, um, the isotopic analyses, that is what showed that the Casanadolo skull was indeed out of place. Because the, what they did is they took all of the other um, Pliocene mammal bones and they analyzed a ton of them, right? They looked at all of the ratios, and the ratios were were indicative of local climate, local diet. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, except for the proposed human remains. Those ones clocked thousands upon thousands of years more recently, which of course is indicative of reworking. Um, uh, and this isn't something that's super uncommon, right? Like reworking is a natural part of, of, of our planet's geologic processes, which is why it's so important in modern paleontology that it's considered. My concern is always the reason I find myself being less trustful of some of these 18 reports from the 1800s is because a lot of this wasn't known back then. It's not their fault. They didn't know about it. I don't think it's malicious or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be like expecting Darwin to understand that, that Mendelian genetics is the method of inherited traits. Um, he just didn't know. He didn't have access to that kind of information. But moreover, if this is the case, if, if your hypothesis here is correct and anatomically modern humans have, have persisted, again, let's only go as far back as the Miocene, um, this, this kind of thing should be as common as, as at very least some of the hominins that we're finding um, in places like Africa. We should be finding many, many, many examples if humans have been this pervasive um, and have been using these kinds of technologies. There's a paper that was published in 2015 um, called Lithic Landscapes. And what they effectively, you might have heard of it, uh, you probably read it, um, but they did an estimation of how many stone tools were probably across all of Africa in, in the, over the course of several million years. And it was something to the, to the tune of like 15 trillion to 50 trillion stone tools. And that's because we're humans and a lot of our relatives are tool makers just like we are. We leave tools wherever we go, which is why again, lithics has been so heavily studied. But we don't find this pervasive tool um, uh, tool assemblage anywhere else. Um, and moreover, as kind of a last thought before I kind of, you know, punt it your way, we don't find ubiquitous uh, uh, human interaction with animals. If humans, let's, let's take it a step further, uh, as you did in some sections of, of hidden history and say, well, maybe anatomically modern humans have persisted as far back as the Cretaceous or the Cambrian or something along those lines. Um, there's nothing even close to, to human interaction with um, 
trilobites or synapsids or dinosaurs or, or anything along those lines, which you would expect. That would be a part of the hypothesis, right? That, that we should find some support for this kind of thing. And given how many dinosaurs we pull up, I mean, we find something like a new dinosaur every week. Um, we should be finding this stuff. If we're finding, um, you know, hominins that have a one in a trillion chance of, of first of all, fossilizing, second of all, mineralizing or being buried, then mineralizing, then being exposed to the surface at the right place, right time for, a, you know, an anthropologist to stumble across it. Um, we should find a trace of this kind of thing. Can I say a couple of things? Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I monologue. <laughs> Arjuna okay. knows I monologue sometimes. You sometimes yeah. just interrupt me. <laughs> well, sorry, go ahead. Well, you've politely asked to interject a, a few points. Yes, yes, please do. I've allowed please you do to. So, uh, in terms of trilobites, the the footprint that was discovered at Antelope Springs in uh, Utah. And I'm saying this is a very extreme anomaly, but what it showed is a footprint, which is actually a, a shoe print, not a footprint, a, a, a naked, you know, it's like a shoe print. And in it, there is a crushed trilobite. I mean, so such things do exist. But, um, and the other point was that, well, I'll just leave it at that, that sometimes there are, there are discoveries of exactly the type that you're, you're mentioning. And, you know, sometimes, oh, the, the yeah, the other point I was going to mention is, yeah, you were saying uh, we should find lots of fossils of, of uh, hominins and humans, anatomically modern humans, if there were any. But it's really interesting that uh, that they've found, and they've been looking, but they have found no fossil evidence of chimpanzees you know, until maybe very recently, I think I saw one report or somebody has finally yeah. claimed to have found one. But, you know, that's uh, an example of how you can have, you know, some creature that was very common in Africa, but for which there is no real fossil evidence or the t only the tiniest fragment. So that's there. You, Another, you are, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Another point is, like until very recently, most scientists believe that the only, or paleontologists, evolutionary biologists, believe that the only mammals that existed during the Jurassic and prior to that were uh, small, about the size of a mouse or a rat or something. But then in China, recently, paleontologists, you know, have discovered large mammals. You know, they found a carnivorous, carnivorous mammal, you know, like a dog or a wolf, that, that type of body, uh, that family, a large, the size of a large dog today, like a German shepherd or something. And they found uh, baby dinosaur bones in its belly area. You know, so you had this huge carnivorous mammal that was eating little dinosaurs, quite revolutionary. So, I mean, occasionally you do find things like that. And, you know, like I said, in the, in the beginning, I was making my claim that what I'm claiming is that if you look at the entire history of archaeology from beginning to the present, you are going to find reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity. And I think that's undeniable. But whether they satisfy today's dominant consensus, you know, that's another thing. 
like you were mentioning, okay, these early archaeologists from the 19th century, I mean, what did they know? And now we've come so much further. Does that mean that 200 years from now, biological anthropologists are going to look back at you and say, well, of course they made mistakes and, you know, they, or do you think you're on a progressive march towards truth? I mean, these are the kinds of things that I uh, sometimes consider when I hear arguments about, well, what did they know 150 years ago or 100 years ago? Um, uh, that's uh, you know, taking a larger view of things. I have to consider things like that. And I'm not trying to convince you. That, I mean, what I'm, the only thing that I'm claiming is that there may be other ways to look at things. And they may be minority views. You know, like, you know, there's a historian and philosopher of science who recently wrote uh, about me in a book he, he called Minority Report. And in that book, he's looking at the question of how does mainstream science deal with minority opinions in their field? Uh, you know, like there's now most scientists favor the out of Africa theory of evolution. Well, there's some, you know, that support a uh, multi-regional hypothesis of, you know, where, you know, you have not homo sapiens originating in one place and then radiating out, but separately emerging in different places and having some interbreeding. So, all right. So how do, how does, the main group, the dominant group, deal with that group. Hmm. Yeah, yeah but, I think, oh, sorry. But sometimes what happens is that, and it's happened many times in the history of science, that a minority opinion would become the dominant opinion. Like in astronomy, you look at the history of astronomy, it happens. It happened in biology. You know, like Darwin wrote in his book, well, you know, when I began writing The Origin of Species, I was a uh, uh, creationist who believed in special creation, the idea that God separately manifested all the different species. And he said that was the dominant view in the universities at that time. Most of the experts favored that. So... He was in a minority position. Uh, and you know, I think you're right about one thing, uh, Erica, and that is if the person in the minority position is desiring to influence or change in any way the dominant consensus in a discipline, uh, they're more likely to succeed if they find some body of evidence that solves a problem in that mainstream group. You know, so uh, if you, and I, I think that's a, a reasonable position to take. Uh, I think it is. If, if I may respond to a couple things here. So, with regard to the trilobite, because I'm, I'm, I know I'm moving back a little bit. Um, I remember reading about that trilobite. I remember thinking and looking into it after that. Crushed trilobites aren't terribly uncommon. Um, they're not common, but they're not terribly uncommon. These are organisms living all over the place during the Cam or during the um, uh, yeah during the Cambrian, right. getting crushed by falling rocks and things of that nature. I think, I think claiming that it was stepped upon by a shoe. I think that that's going to require a bit more than than a, a shoe shaped a shoe because shoes are you know what they're shaped like that. Um, I remember the picture. I didn't. I, I was trying to listen though. I didn't want to look into it too much. Um, when we find trilobites that are like in 
in the pits having been crushed by all sorts of different shapes of, of rock. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very skeptical about that um, just because the, 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 the chain of command that you have to go from, from crushed trilobite by something vaguely shoe-shaped to it was a shoe worn by an anatomically modern human during the Cambrian, that's quite, that's quite a, a series of, of connections to make. I, I admit that. I admit that this is a, yeah. an extreme anomaly. You know, I'm not going to claim. I mean, in the original book, Forbidden Archaeology, many of these extreme anomalies we had in a uh, a special appendix. Right. Because, yeah. Right. Because in the main book, is that the, the main picture? I yeah, think that's, that is. That's, yeah, that, I think yeah. I believe that's the picture. See, and what's strange about this too is that the the upper left portion is is level. The upper left portion is level with the with the side of the rock. So I think it's I I think there's the potential here as well that it's not necessarily even in the shape of a shoe, but that the way that the rock broke is in the shape of a shoe. Um, I think you would almost need a larger slab with with a very clear indentation to show that. Um, I mean, it's clearly a crushed trilobite, but again, those those aren't those aren't terribly uncommon. Right. Um, with I wanted to add something else here too. So chimp fossils, that is totally correct. What you said about the chimpanzee fossil record is entirely correct. It's not just for the chimps though. It's any kind of organism that lives in the jungle. And the reason for this, and as we know for now, the reason for this is that animals that live in the jungle when they die, they fall to the ground, and even if they are buried, the soil is not at all conducive to preservation. The soil is too, uh, the chemistry of the soil actually dissolves bone uh, in many cases. So it's not just chimpanzees, it's also gorillas, it's also orangutans, it's also gibbons, it's also all sorts of different kinds of non-primate critters that live in the jungle. The only reason, fortunately, that the human fossil record is so good and that the fossil record of many organisms uh, that, that didn't live in jungles, different types of dinosaurs, different types of synapsids, um, things of this nature, is, is because they lived in areas that were conducive to fossilization and preservation. Um, so that, and this is taphonomically, we can show this taphonomically today, right? So we can go into the jungle, test the pH of the soil, and show whether or not something effectively made of calcium is going to, to survive 10 years, let alone 10 million years. Uh, and the answer is no. Um, so so there's there, this is what you would call a taphonomic bias. So taphonomy being the study of how things preserve after they die. Um, do, and this humans, is, do humans live in jungles today? Some of them do. Yeah, okay. some of them do. So but, you, but humans also, were, but humans also what don't if, live in the jungle. What if humans were largely living in forest or jungles in the and distant I, past? I would imagine that even if that were the case, though, you would receive over the course of, I don't know, 3.8 billion years, you would get you would get a single a single support of a stone tool or a human um, being reliably found in in a, in a strata that, and I realize reliable is is up for debate. Right. <laughs> um, but is, something well, like for something for something to overturn that kind of paradigm, like I said earlier, it's it's got to be. It's got to be undeniably the case, and I think that it's very telling because one thing I wrote here as well is, you know, what I don't mean to disparage the people from the 1800s. In fact, I take the stance that people 100 years from now will look back on me and say, "Look, they did the best they could with what they had." Um, mm -hmm. the, I, I envy the people who live 100 years from now because their view of of the fossil record and and of science in general is going to be so much more complete than mine is. Um, how little I know in comparison to, to them is, it's very tragic to me. I mean, that's assuming humans make it that long, but I am jealous. Um, but I, I, yeah, I look back on the folks in the 1800s and, and I think to myself, it's not just in paleoanthropology, it's in numerous fields. It's, and as science still is today, although, you know, it's getting more accurate as technology increases, um, but, but mistakes are very scattershot and it's across numerous different disciplines. Uh, as you mentioned before, paradigms shift to some degree all the time. Um, but I'm taking a course right now called Theory and Methods in Paleoanthropology or Biological Anthropology. And mm -hmm. one of our assignments very recently was to read a paper by uh, by Bernard Wood, uh, by Wood and, and Richmond, for Brian Richmond, I believe, uh, from the year 2000. And the idea was to look in 21 years, how much has human evolution, has the story of human evolution, how much has it changed? 
even though we've gone from having 10 odd hominins to 20 plus hominins? How has it changed? Um, and the answer is not much. The overall, the overall concept of, of this organism coming out of the trees, this primate coming out of the trees, becoming bipedal before it has a large brain, um, and and effectively dominant, coming to dominate the savanna with, with various morphologic adaptations, has remained broadly the same. And it's it's become actually quite a bit bolstered by, by genetic evidence, which I know we don't talk about much here because I prefer the paleontology and, and you do as well. Um, yeah. But it can't be ignored that humans are 98.8% similar to panins, to, to chimps and bonobos, and that our haplogroups do show, there's a reason, the reason the out of Africa hypothesis has become so popular compared to the multi-regional hypothesis in, in the past two decades is because of the completion of the Human Genome Project and the investigation into haplotypes. Um, it's, it's this, the hat mapping too was really big on that. And what it shows is that all humans nest into this mitochondrial node that's in Africa. Um, and there's no way to get around that genetically. There's no way to 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 futz with the data, um, and and kind of and kind of maneuver it into a different way. With regard to the mammal and the Cretaceous, I totally buy that. I think I have no issue with with a, although I feel I can't be certain. I feel like I remember seeing that that announcement. I feel like it was the Cretaceous and not the Jurassic. Um, and if that is the case, we're looking at you know it might have been the Cretaceous. Which, which is more significant to, in my opinion, because mammals were coming to be pretty decent players on the on the bottom rung of the of the food chain at that time period. Badger-sized mammals have, have been accepted, I believe, for quite some time. So a small or a, a medium to a large dog doesn't seem like a huge stretch. Um, and I would imagine that if you are a large mammal, preying on dinosaur eggs and small dinosaurs is is going to be probably what's primarily on the menu, since mammals were present but not common. Um, in the Cretaceous compared to uh, the, the the subsequent um, the subsequent geologic periods, um, I think I think that there is something to be said for this this concept of like moving looking at data, looking at at um, kind of uh, these these older papers, these older claims with an open mind. Uh, but but the thing is is that when the ones that I've looked into, I I think that the conventional explanation which is of course bolstered by things like radiometric dating. Like you said, these, these paradigms switch usually because technology increases. But there is one thing that doesn't change and hasn't changed effectively since its inception, and those are laws in physics. Now how those laws impact other things can change, but the laws themselves don't. At least I've, I've never heard of an example of a, of a law of physics being changed. Uh, and one of those is the law of radioactive decay. So my point of course being that the dating of a lot of this stuff, while it can get more precise, it isn't going to be moving by millions or billions of years, or even, I imagine, thousands of years, um, because we're, we're measuring iso parent-to-daughter isotopes. That's a data point, right? Um, so while you can get, again, you can get it more precise, it's not going to move in the opposite direction too much, if that makes sense. And I think that that's what sort of makes the, the shift of the paradigm to ubiquitous human antiquity across the geologic column, that's going to make that very difficult. Uh, because with the precision of radiometric dating, you're going to have to find uh, effectively anatomically modern human remains in, it, it should be very easy to prove if you find um, if you find these remains where they shouldn't be. And yet this isn't, this isn't popping up despite scouring these, these geologic periods. Um, I know, as you said, that you're you're supposing that they are being found, but why is it, in your opinion, is it exclusively in these papers from the 1800s? Why have there been no modern examples of of humans where they shouldn't be if it's not the advent of modern technology showing reworking? Um, what is your comment on the 2015-16 paper that I mentioned? Oh Major yes. Of, of Older by Gorge, yes. So I looked at that. I actually pulled it up when you were when you were talking, um, just because I wanted to see if I had read it by chance. Um, and the the hominins that they compared it to. Let me pull it back up here. But first of all, it, it was published in Nature Communications. So usually, when notes are published in Nature Communications, it's because it's a broad observation that you want to stake a claim to. Um, and then, supposing you do a more in depth analysis, you can publish a more in depth paper. Uh, you know, in, in any journal really that you want. This is just getting it out there uh, that mm -hmm. these folks are saying, hey, we're looking at this, uh, what do you think? Now, very notable, 
is that they did not compare this individual in this note that I'm looking at here, Nature Communications 2015, uh, 6, volume 7987, it's not being compared to Homo erectus, any of the even potential Homo erectines. Uh, so that, that's not Homo georgicus, which was, in the, or which was um, north of the area, not Homo erectus, which was in the area, and not uh, Homo ergaster, which was also uh, in the area and in the area adjacent. So what their findings say, what they say here is the findings suggest that some human-like traits emerged in early human evolution and that a modern looking hominin existed more primitive, existed uh, essentially contemporaneous with more primitive body creatures in East Africa. There was a much larger paper published on contemporaneity in East Africa and in South Africa, I believe in 2016. But the organisms that are living contemporaneously with one another, it's not, it's not like, it's not the same organism that is being proposed. It's not literally like, this is Homo rudolfensis that we found much earlier, and this is that same exact species with, with no variation living alongside something like Homo erectus. Um, mm. Instead, it's the likes of Paranthropus, what's, what's the East Africa specimen? Uh, Aethiopicus, of, of Paranthropus Aethiopicus hanging out with the likes of Homo erectus, and potentially late surviving Australopithecines. But again, this isn't, we're not looking at Australopithecus afarensis, essentially living contemporaneous. It's a different type of Australopithecine. Um, this, this would be analogous to the fact that chimpanzees live with us today. Um, we're, we're both apes. We've both changed quite a bit since our common ancestor. And if you compared us to, to say, an Australopithecine and a member of the chimps lineage, if we could find them, um, it, it, would be, it would be quite similar to this situation. So while it's an interesting find, they're not saying it's anatomically modern Homo sapiens as, as a phalange. They're saying that it has modern traits to it, uh, which are very different situations. Well, did you see their direct quotes at the end of their paper where they say, this is most uh, similar to modern Homo sapiens? To early Homo sapiens, so archaic Homo sapiens, who's, when we're looking at hands, so obviously tool use is conducive. What's the title of the article, the paper? Old Finger with Modern Traits. Is that all that it says? I see human evolution, old finger with modern traits. That's all mine says. Is that from the Nature Communications? Um, yes. Research highlights it's alongside lung pathogen evolves in isolation, carbon dioxide level peak up high, suspended rods serve as bits, cosmic neutrinos abound, things like that. Because the version of the paper I had had this title in it, earliest modern human-like hand bone from a new 1.84 million year old site at Ulduvai Gorge, Tanzania. That's that's like right the same as what mine says though. It's early, it's modern human-like. The idea, when we're looking at human evolution, the idea is to look at how basal traits became anatomically modern, right? So if you're looking at something that is more derived than it is modern, or more derived than it is basal, what you would say is that it's, it's modern-like. That doesn't mean it is modern. Otherwise, they would say anatomically modern phalange found in 1.8 million year old bed. If you read like the, the wording, the, the types of language that they're using, not one time is it saying that this is an, an anatomically modern no, human. No, I don't say that. But... Uh, I mean, you, you know, though, like... Neanderthals have anatomically modern human-like hands. It's very difficult to tell the difference between, especially with um, with carpals. Fingertips are easier because Neanderthals have broader fingertips than we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my point is that if every time there is something modern human-like and you attribute it to... Uh, some creature, you know, there's a mosaic evolution. Well, it must have belonged to some hominin with, uh, you know, anatomically modern human foot bones or, or uh, an anatomically modern human finger structure or, you know, you can always say that. 
But, but you can't. That's it. It's not. That's no, not what, what you I'm can saying, do. What, I, what what I'm saying is, the usual response when something that looks human and is called human-like, and you know, they say, well, it's part of some hominin that you know possessed a trait that persisted into the modern human species. Uh, that's one set of assumptions one could have. Looking at it from a different perspective, you could say, well, why not accept it as something that came from an anatomically modern type of human? I think, I think the issue with that, though, Michael, is that that's, that's not... That's not correct. That's not correct methodology. I'm looking. I actually found a better. I I was looking at, I was looking at the summer a summary of the article in the table of contents of Nature, not actually the the article itself. So I've got that up now. And from Figure Three, the form of the human proximal phalanx. It looks at OH86 and it groups it within Homo, but it is the most basal kind of Homo phalanx. It's not even as anatomical. It's not even lumped as with anatomically modern Homo sapiens known phalanx. It's lumped over by Kibara too. So the way that they do this, the reason why you wouldn't say, okay, well, it looks anatomically modern human. Why not say it's not anatomically modern human? And the reason is because it doesn't match anatomically modern human um, uh, uh, measurements when you compare it measurement by measurement. So. It's not that it, like, it's the same thing with the Laetoli footprint, footprints. The initial folks who went and found the Laetoli footprints, they look at them, they say, these look human. But upon closer inspection, they are indeed not. The measurements don't match up with an anatomically modern human. They're close, but it's not anatomically modern. And that's what's going on with this. I, I, I'm looking at the, the paper, I believe, hopefully I'm looking at the right thing now. Uh, Dominguez, Rodrigo. Yeah, but it's and I can I can share my screen here and and show here. Let me let me pull it up so that everyone can see it because I want to be able to show. Oh, you're you already have it up. Okay, so figure yeah. So you want to go to figure three if you can pull that up over there. If you can scroll up to figure three. Yeah, there you go. Uh, down a little bit more to the uh, phylogenetic. What they, but what do they yeah. call in the in the summary at the top the blue shaded area? What do they identify that as? In the blue, sh in yeah, the, homo sapiens. Just, just a little bit above where they've got, you know, the results of their statistical analysis. Yes. So it, it, it is mapping, again, it's mapping with homo sapiens. It's mapping in genus homo here, what they're comparing. And I, I apologize, I misspoke earlier not saying saying that it wasn't lumping with Homo sapiens. You're correct. It's lumping with Homo sapiens. It's lumping with archaic Homo sapiens in most similarities. But you'll notice, too, they're not comparing it to other members of genus Homo. This is what I said earlier when I was, when I was talking about it before we actually pulled it up. There's no Homo erectus comparison. There's no Homo ergaster comparison. There's no Homo georgicus comparison. Nothing with uh, Neanderthal lenses. Nothing with uh, Heidelbergensis. Is, Just that, yes. is that because there aren't any relevant fossils from those creatures? I don't, I don't imagine that that's the case because we've got a wealth of Neanderthal lenses and a, and a quite decent fossil record for, I would imagine even Tracana boy or Nari Katomi boy has, let me pull up. I think a few years ago I was reading that they have not recovered any foot bones of the uh, Homo erectus, maybe since yeah, then. It, yeah, for for Homo erectus, at least the one that I usually look at is uh, Nari Kotomi, just because it's so well preserved. Um, but I'm looking, I'm definitely seeing in Nari Kotomi um, tarsals, which would be a part of the feet. Uh, but more more importantly than that, what indicates bipedality in an organism is going to be the shape of the pelvis, uh, the valgus nature of the knee the femoral head, the foramen magnum, um, and uh, muscle attachment sites along distal limb or distal parts of the limb. 
And for Naria Katomi Boy and indeed for other members of Homo Erectus, we, we have that material. These guys were definitively bipeds. If, if we wanted to make them a quadruped, it would be biomechanically impossible. Um, and the same goes actually for, for members of Paranthropus and members like Australopithecus afarensis. Um, it for sure, and you mentioned this in Hidden History, for sure it has basal shoulders, very basal upper arms, the humerus is very basal, even the hands are very primitive. But that being said, this thing walked on two feet. It had it has the bull-shaped pelvis, it has the valgus knee. Um, and to show, I'll share my screen if I can share my screen. Um, uh, yeah, I'll you can. Yep. Yeah. Um, Just because it's it's a very relevant. I'm gonna get it's a very relevant. Yeah, here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so Australopithecines. Oops, I put share instead of present. Ah, can I get out of this? Okay, present. Should be coming. Yeah, so Australopithecines, they have this angle, this, this valgus knee that does not track with arboreal quadrupeds. It doesn't track with knuckle walking apes. It doesn't even track with what we see as a, a upright suspensory animals, which have a more ventral foramen magnum that is closer than a chimpanzee to what you would see in hominins. What we see in Lucy's femur specifically, but also, like I said, we have remains from over 300 uh, Australopithecus, members of Australopithecus as a genus, we see ubiquitously a biped's femur. We see ubiquitously a biped's foramen magnum. Um, we see in their in their uh, footprints that they're leaving at Laetoli, this isn't anatomically modern. An anatomically modern human with as many foot deformities as you could possibly have could not make these prints because this animal was biomechanically sound but bore its weight in, in a way that was absolutely distinct for modern humans and knuckle walking apes. Um, You're giving the, the mainstream opinion, no doubt. But yeah, I mean, I've it's, it's fairly just, recent. Uh, I, I would, pro of, I would of, propose, like, oh, sorry, go. I, I'm, I'm rambling, anyways. Go ahead. There have been fairly recent studies done about the biomechanics of the gait and. Yes. Of studies done, you know, comparing the footprints of, you know, humans and different substrates and mm -hmm. things like that. And although, you know, the, the dominant opinion, and I, I'm not talking about Christian creationists or mm -hmm. other people who are looking from different perspectives, but even within the discipline, there are at least a few people who have come to you know, different conclusions. Uh, there, there are folks who will come to the conclusion that Australopithecines had some arboreality still in their locomotion. I would wager that in the past decade, there isn't a, a paleoanthropologist that thinks that this thing wasn't a terrestrial biped. I would, I would be, I, I mean, and, and this is, an this is what I have. An occasional biped. There's even some arboreal monkeys or gibbons, I think. Gibbon, I think I've seen mentioned, have valgus knee. And, you know. Yeah, they, the, the gibbons have a semi-valgus knee, but it doesn't, it doesn't track with what we see with humans and hominins. Mm -hmm. um, it's more so than a chimp. And this is because when you think of a gibbon or an orangutan moving in the trees, they move like this. A chimp moves like this. Right, they're they're semi uh, bipedal in the sense that they've got a, vent a more ventral foramen magnum than than say a macaque or a baboon, but given still they don't have a knee that is that is biomechanically sound for efficient uh, terrestrial locomotion on two feet. This isn't what we see in the Australopithecines. You're right. Yes, these guys could potentially be uh, walking on two feet when they come down from the trees. But what we know for certain is that when they're coming down from the trees, they're doing so a lot. Otherwise, you wouldn't see any kind of selection for this uh, inline halix or big toe. It would still stay jetted out to the side like what we see in Artipithecus ramidus. Um, and we wouldn't see this, this trend towards a more, more efficient um, bipedal locomotion than what we see in Gibbons, which is bent hip, bent knee, um, and almost a sort, of, a sort of awkward shamble. Uh, some some metabolic studies have been published on Australopithecines based off of things like the Laetoli footprints uh, and the remains at Dakika, different 
foot morphologies that we have from different kinds of australopithecines. And the question was, okay, we know these guys could walk, but could they run? Because there's a huge difference between walking and running biomechanically. Walking is a transfer of weight. Running is almost like pogo sticking from foot to foot. These things couldn't run very well. And what that supports is the retention of some traits conducive to arboreality, but a life that was primarily spent moving from tree patch to tree patch on two feet on the ground, which is precisely what we would expect from an organism that is transitioning from a life in the trees to a life on the savanna. You can't do it all at once. And this is why we see all of that selection moving towards locomotion and not brain case size, which comes second and not until about two, three million years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this has been really I, fun. I, I really enjoyed picking your brain here on this too. This has been a great time for me. Yeah, I, I'm fully prepared to accept that you're representing the, the dominant view in your discipline. I'm not disputing that. What I would say, however, is that even within your discipline, and not from people who are looking at things from some outside perspective mm -hmm. like me, where I have you know, some entirely different perspective, but even within your discipline, there are people who, at least I've encountered in the study that I've done, that have at least slightly different views. That's probably and, true. And, and if we look historically, I mean, it's, I think, without question, look at people like Oxnard and others, uh, you know, it's, uh, and again, it gets into the whole question of the history of science. I mean, what, mostly what we get, as far as I can see, is we're getting at any point in time, the opinion of the mainstream consensus using the methods and that have become customary in that discipline at this time. And even when questioned, most of them would say, but things may change. We're giving our provisional understanding based on what we know now. This is what our view is. And they'd be prepared to admit it's not set in stone, could change. And if you look at the longer history of science, you see things sometimes do radically change. And we do sometimes. I, I think I think you're right. I, as as a quick note in there though when paradigms change it's usually it usually doesn't change past data points it adds to the existing data and gives a new perspective um which is why i'm saying if if you if you're to, in order to support your hypothesis it can be done it's not unfalsifiable right which is good that's good that means that we can investigate it scientifically it it there's got to be a, uh, uh, a shift that can show ubiquitously this this human antiquity um, w beyond a shadow of a doubt in the same way that we're showing um, beyond a shadow of a doubt that there are hominins that are very closely related to humans um, that do appear to show this slow gradual change over time of morphology um, and they overlap in some places but the general trend is this this gradient of traits and if you could show that, that all of these organisms in some way or another existed in their present form via the fixity of species through time all the way to the Cambrian, that would really be something. Well, that would really be something. Sometimes it takes time and more than one person and more than one generation for change that's to true take too. place. Yeah, but, that's true too. But um, <clears throat> I think there are larger epistemological issues you know, involved about what sources of knowledge could be consulted. Uh, you know, I presented a paper once at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress. It was, uh, it was called Sensory Archaeology. They were looking at the, the role of the senses and consciousness in that field, how it 
influences research. So I presented a paper about a very prominent South African scientist, J.T. Robinson, who was involved in uh, a, a lot of the initial discoveries of Australopithecus at Sterkfontein and other mm. sites in South Africa. <clears throat> it's not very well known, but he, he found, he took a psychic that he met through the Theosophical Society into the Sterkfontein cave. <clears throat> and, you know, there was a question, you know, like about some of the fossil evidence. Did it represent Paranthropus or, uh, you know, something uh, more towards the human line or some Australopithecine or whatever? So he took this psychic to the Sterkfontein caves. I've, got a photograph of it. Psychic is lying on his back on, uh, on the floor of the cave, and J.T. Robinson is there. He'd place a fossil of Australopithecus on his forehead, and uh, the, the, the psychic claimed to be able to actually see what that hominin was doing, you know, millions of years ago. So uh, uh, that uh, he he wrote that he actually got some insights from what he learned from this psychic. So I kind of gave that as an example of a prominent paleontologist uh, using some other source of inspiration you know, to inform his understanding of the fragmentary fossil evidence that he had at his disposal. So I remember at that conference, uh, one of the archaeologists came up to me later and he said, I'd never heard that before. And I said, well, that's what I'm here you know, to tell you about something you don't already know. So I, I would kind of see that as my function <clears throat> in this exchange of views between representatives of different knowledge traditions about, uh, <clears throat> about a topic of common interest. Because mm -hmm. we're all, whether we're followers of the Vedas or scientists or some combination of them, we're all interested in these questions. And that's true. And uh, I've often said, you know, uh, <clears throat> that <clears throat> I learned something from people in the professional scientific disciplines, like archaeology, for example, uh, because of their focus study on uh, their focus discipline study of the material, there there is something to you know, for someone who's approaching things from a, another knowledge perspective. There is something that I can get that's valuable from what you've said, what others that I've met have said. Uh, and that kind of informs my work also. I think you're right. At the very least, what we get is, is a better understanding of where the other person is coming from. And I think there's value in that as well. I think that that there's always value in, in taking a new perspective and looking at things from another angle, even if you don't change your mind. Um, and that's, that's why I have fun with these conversations. I always learn something new. Um, yeah, Arjuna, I know, I know you were trying to get out of here at seven. Do we want to do a Q and A or anything like that? Or 
Uh, I don't have a particular schedule. Like we're in lockdown in New Zealand, so I can fit in lots of streams um, at the moment. So I don't know how you guys are doing for time, but um, if people have questions, they can start sending them in. Um, okay. So yeah, we, we in ten minutes we'll be at two hours. We, we usually go two hours, but if things are juicy, then we keep going. So <laughs> going to someone commented, is it going to be another four hour stream? Because we did three and a half hours with Gunter Beckley and Erica last time, we which did. is still my longest stream on the channel and probably will remain that way. That that was a very fun. I really enjoyed talking with Gunter. I really did. I, I actually need to email him. He sent me several papers and it was right when I was starting orientation. And so I did <laughs> not have time to get back to him. So I owe him a, a handful of emails. Um, I if I, Unfortunately, as much as I would love to go for another three and a half hours, um, <laughs> I did tell my fiance that we would have dinner around like seven, Sweet. 15, seven, 10, something like that. So I, I have, I, I could probably go another 10 minutes, but then I probably have to go. All right. I'll just see if any questions are coming in so far. We haven't got any, um, with regard to the, the, the apes or whatever that they didn't compare that finger bone to, perhaps they didn't compare them because there was no reason to, they already knew that they weren't similar. Potentially. I think the, the, the issue with that is though, is that, dexterity in the hands is is something that's being pretty scrutinized even though modern hands things like precision precision grip um emerge pretty early one thing that and one of my colleagues is actually working on this right now that that's really being looked into is handedness right so a lot of scrutiny is being looked at with regard to the hands of late genus homo uh, not because they're not derived hands but because the, we want to find out when left-handed or right left-handed or right-handedness uh sort of evolved um, because humans are very strange and that we're predominantly right-handed, like 90% of people are right-handed um, and other primates don't show handedness. And when they do, it's usually only in the hominids. So like chimps, orangs, gorillas, uh, and most of them are left-handed, which is really weird. So it's like, why are they left-handed and why are we right-handed? What, what changed over that course? So I would be very surprised if that, it, if, if they weren't looking to compare it, um, because they knew, especially with the proximal phalanx, because like I said, that that derivation of of the hand comes pretty, like, pretty solidly in Genus Homo by Homo erectus. The stuff that's changing is going to be distal phalanx, right? Because like I said, the, the Neanderthals have um, much less of a nice fleshy pad for gripping than than um, Homo sapiens does. Uh, why that is, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. But but like, if you gave a paleontologist a, a distal phalanx from from Neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens, or like even Adam Heilbergensis, you'd be able to tell the difference. I don't know so much with the proximal, but even so, I'm comfortable from from what Michael showed of the of the paper and from what I was able to glean. I'm comfortable with this being Homo sapiens. Um, maybe that's why they didn't show it. Maybe you're right. Maybe the reason they didn't compare it is because they knew it was Homo sapiens. But one thing is evident from the comparisons that they did show, and that's that it's very archaic. In fact, it's the most archaic uh, that, that they were able to show. Now, at 1.8 million years, my first question, especially with Olduvai Gorge, because we do find, if memory serves, Homo sapiens remains at Olduvai Gorge. East Africa is thought to be the place where, where actually anatomically modern humans uh, evolved, um, like where anatomically modern humans first pop up. So while it wouldn't be surprising, um, my first question would be, is there a reworking going on? Um, and maybe that's what they're looking into because all gorge is notoriously, um, intrabedded. There's a lot of interfingering going on with the, with the deposits there, but I haven't had a chance to look at the whole paper, so I don't know. Right. That's interesting about, um, monkeys being mostly left-handed. Perhaps it's because yeah. we, we, we use our left brain more, which is like logical thinking and so on. And, uh, monkeys are probably using their right brain more, which is more intuition and, less logical maybe i don't know it's it's an interesting question my, my like i said my colleague is looking at um she's actually comparing it. it's not it's much easier to work with extants than it is with the hominid um hominid fossil record rather so she's actually looking at a, a handful of primates um that haven't been looked at for handedness and she's trying to find out if maybe any of them show handedness either and how that compares so we'll see <laughs> so simple we've, question we've got a question for erica how would you know if the prevailing paradigm were wrong um, the nice thing about the prevailing paradigm is the prevailing the prevailing paradigm is always falsifiable. Um, in this case, the definitive way to know, like if if Michael's hypothesis were correct here, is if someone walked out to the Burgess Shale 
and they went to an area that was un very underlooked on the Burgess Shale, and they found in an undisturbed stratum examined by numerous geologists, a human, anatomically modern human skeleton. In fact, if you found a mammal in the Burgess Shale, you'd be able to overturn all of, of evolution as we know it. If you could show that rock wasn't, over, wasn't reworked, which if it's in the Burgess Shale, it's probably not, uh, you're, you're overturning the entire paradigm right there. And that same, that same idea goes for like the Ediacaran, really it goes for like the carbon. If you're finding mammals in the Carboniferous, that, that would be pretty groundbreaking. Um, really, any, anytime you're getting out of place fossils to that degree, is going to be significant. Don't confuse me though, because there is there is a difference between something that is severely out of order and something that is persisting. Uh, a classic example is some people take the Devonian uh, tetrapod tracks and they say, this is how we know, oh, this is very problematic for evolution. The Devonian tetrapod tracks are one, very basal. Um, and two, it's important to know that when you find a fossil, it's not the first time that that organism appeared. That fossil is the first time that it fossilized. Mm -hmm. And organisms live for a long time, which is why, fortunately, unlike a lot of um, evangelical takes on, uh, Christian evangelical takes on young earth creationism, uh, what, what Michael has presented is definitely testable as a hypothesis. That's really good, because like I said, that means we can look at it scientifically. Maybe he'll be proven to be correct. I don't know the future. I, I doubt it, personally, but I could be totally wrong. In 100 years, Michael and I will be Wherever we are in the future, uh, if we persist in some way, having a, a lovely conversation about how wrong I was. <laughs> yeah, or maybe, let's go maybe a million years. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. So, know. yeah, oh, my, my claim was, as I was trying to indicate in the beginning, my hypothesis that I was looking at, and I'm looking at things more from the perspective of history of science and mm. philosophy of science than, you know, trying to say, you know, well, I'm a professional paleontologist, and, you know, I'm disputing what you say. My, my claim as a representative of the Vedic knowledge tradition was, uh, you know, for me, a statement from the Puranas is something to take seriously. But I can't expect uh, an archaeologist at a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists to accept the statement from the Puranas as being in any way meaningful to their field of study. Uh, they want to confine themselves to physical evidence, although not all of them. You know, I, I've met archaeologists uh, who have said, we've got to consider other things, other epistemologies. And, but for the most part, you know, they, they're pretty much fixed in their methodology and their ontology and epistemology. So my claim was, if what the Puranas say is true in any sense of the word, there should be reports of archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity. And uh, so I tested that hypothesis but by looking at the whole archaeological literature from you know, the time of Darwin up to the present. And I found, okay, you know, if you look at the scientific literature, you know, you've got two types, primary and secondary. And in today's secondary literature, you don't find any evidence for extreme human antiquity. But, you know, if you look at things, the whole history, you'll find many reports in the primary scientific literature of scientists who have said they have found evidence for anatomically modern humans or uh, even any kind of ape man. You shouldn't find any type of hominid. It shouldn't be any older than six or seven million years old. But you do find many reports of such things. So 
Uh, now, you could say, all right, well, but they're not credible. They're... But that wasn't my claim. You know, defending, defending these reports or uh, not accepting them for this reason or that reason, you know, that we can talk about. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think, I yes, I, I agree. If, if the hypothesis was we should find those reports, I would say that the hypothesis panned out. That, like you said, the question is, do they hold up? Whether, on whether or not they truly are true, the question is, do they hold up? Um, and that's kind of what we've been arguing about, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, so that, that's uh, taking it to another level. But to get to that level, we, we at least have to admit that those things are there, which... Yeah, but I'm, are they as they say they are, though? That's, that's, the, that's the question I'm more interested in asking. Um, because, you, you know, there, there are very strange reports of many strange things throughout, throughout history, um, throughout even accepted human antiquity. Um, and I'm interested to it. Well, what did they see? You know, the things like yeah. the battle over Nuremberg. Did that really happen? I don't know. Um, lots the of over, the into, one over Nuremberg. Uh, the battle over Nuremberg. It's, oh, in the it's, sky. Yeah, the 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 report of um, what is effectively UFOs. They look up and they see all these strange things fighting with each other in the air and strange oblong and spherical shapes. It sounds a lot like what. A lot of people, you know, when people are making like UAP or UFO reports today, what they say they see. Um, so did they see that kind of stuff? I don't know. I I'm interested. It would be really cool one way or another. Because if they didn't, why did so many people report it? And if they did, well, what was going on? Was it a natural phenomenon? Was it UFOs? I don't know. Um, and those are the kinds of questions I think that we perhaps even fall guilty to today. Maybe people in 100 years will say, well, did they really see what they say they did? Um, and that's, that's kind of the fun part of investigating the past. It's parsing the true from the false. And how we do that is also part of the battle. Mm -hmm. So I agree 100%. I think it would be interesting to investigate claims of, you know, where, you know, back in time, you know, like in different cultures, they reported people lived for hundreds of years. And if they all reported that at about the same points in history, I think that would be pretty compelling evidence that it, it was actually going on, if they're all converging. Yeah, it would. It would be. It would be interesting. Um, it, another way of looking at that, though, would be if they were all occurring at the same time in like uncontacted cultures. That would be huge. If they were all occurring at the same time and were adjacent, is it possible that they were just counting things up in a different way? Um, there, you see something like that with uh, with like the the biblical patriarchs and the Sumerian kings list and the Babylonian kings list as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are all these cultures that are sitting right adjacent to each other, and they're all saying, "Well, we've got look, we've got kings living for that tens of thousands of years, and then the biblical patriarchs are living to hundreds of years." Um, so yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I would adjacent. You could water. You could place less importance on it but you know if like right. in australia the aboriginals are saying in their own way they were li living for hundreds of years at the same time that the egyptians reporting kings living for hundreds of years i'd say that would be pretty interesting i've not investigated really this i don't i, even not know how to, I don't know, even, even not know how to begin because it's I'm I, not yeah i i i only know the mesopotamian examples so that would be really interesting i don't know um i mean i I would be I would be skeptical, but impressed if that if that really was the case. It would be neat to look into. <laughs> and you could ask the same question with you know like the Greeks talking about all these gods coming down and interacting with them, and if that was happening at the same time, then in India they were talking about all these uh, demigods uh, coming down, and if there's pretty similar descriptions of them, and it's like wow, that's a pretty interesting correlation. Well, it's yeah, it's particularly neat because you've got these cultures that are pretty separate from each other. That's that's the part that's neat is if you've got these similar. I mean, then you get into some weird stuff. It's like, okay, is it happening or is it something Jungian going on, right? Like the whole collective unconscious is is it something like that? Is it that we all have a, a common history of, of storytelling and those stories are evolved in similar ways? Is it that there were actually demigods coming down i don't know i don't have the answer to that question um you I, know i'm 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 inclined to think that humans have similar imaginations but i don't know i don't know that for sure i just say we want to be careful 
uh, with the assumption of uniformitarianism because the, the general tendency is, we, this is what we see today, people live for about 100 years. So if all over the world people are saying people were living to 1,000, it can't be true because people don't live to 100 based on our observation. But it could be that uniformitarianism is wrong and the past was actually different and all these mythical beings were interacting with us and lifespans were longer. Potentially, but I think you would have to present, you would have to present a precedent for that. You know what I mean? Like you would have to be able to say, you would have to present a reason for that interpretation. Like if I wanted to say something like, well, you know, I think that, um, I think that enormous like octopus style creatures, like a Cthulhu style cosmic deity wandered the earth, you know, 2 million years ago. Um, like I can say that and that's one thing, but if I could go back in time and, and you know, find cave art of these crazy, you know, Cthulhu-like creatures moving along the horizon, or, or if I could find some kind of fossil cephalopod that's gigantic, well then, you know, then, then, you're, then you're looking at real stuff, right? And like, then that's like, oh boy, what do we do now? So setting a precedent is important, I think. I, I am of the opinion that there, there should be no question that you can't ask, uh, but setting a precedent helps. Well, I mean, you'd be taking the testimony of these cultures and the fact that they're consistently telling you very similar things, even though they had no interaction, as evidence that it's like real testimony and not just stories. And testimony mm. is accepted in science. I mean, you read a scientific paper, a bunch of people wrote something down and you're taking their word for it. So we, we can't do away with testimony. It's just about, you know, establishing the reliability of something. So if they're all converging and telling the same thing, then it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe they're not just making it up. Potentially, but I would I would give you a little pushback on that because usually the testimony in scientific papers is rooted in uh, uh, replicability. Uh, that's like one of the hallmarks of, of science, right? It's got to be falsifiable. You should be able to repeat the experiment. Um, of course, that's tough when it's like, okay, I found this dinosaur bone here, right? It's like, how do you repeat that? Well, you can't, which is why documentation is so important. I, here's my picture of my dinosaur bone that I found, you know, in Alberta or something like that. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question to ask though, this this whole idea of like, well, why do we see similar mythos in across human cultures that have no contact with each other? You see these repeating tropes of like um, trickster gods or animal hybrid, hu animal human hybrids or, um, you know, sun deities or large floods. Like those things seem to pop up a lot. Um, it's an interesting question. It's a question for cultural anthropologists, unfortunately. Those guys. <laughs> maybe have, maybe those you can guys point you to one. Yeah, I just talk about the the primate aspect. Yeah. I, I'm less on the on the cultural anthropology stuff, but I'm sure you could get a cultural anthropologist talking for hours and hours and hours about what they think about that. That would be fun. Um, so, uh, Michael, do you want to comment on that? And then we can try to fire through some of these questions before we wrap up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> In my book, Human Devolution, I tried to make a case for uh, the kinds of things that you've been talking about. Mm. And kind of I did it in a step-by-step -step fashion. And I think it has a, a lot to do with the question of consciousness, which is an unsolved problem in biology, origin of life, theories, where does consciousness come from? What, what is it? You know, it's uh, kind of an unsolved problem. So I try to make a case that it's not coming from combinations of chemicals in, in the brain or the nervous system. It has its own independent existence. And once that is, a case is made for that, then you can go further step by step uh, to there being consciousness all over the universe, which means at different, different levels, different places, there would be conscious entities of different levels of power and, you know, I'm not just saying this, but, you know, looking at it from the standpoint of research in different areas of science and medicine, you know, that, that a case can be made for that. And then 
the idea would be that the higher beings have some ability to influence biological form and interact with biological forms on other levels. So, you know, you make a case for demigods. So uh, I think it's possible to do. I made a, a little attempt at it. Uh, how are you doing for time, Erica? Is you all right to do some questions? Yeah, we can do some questions. Yeah. You have a couple questions. Oh, so I was going to re mention in relation to science being repeatable that unfortunately a lot of science isn't repeated because there's not grant there's not much grant funding for repeating someone else's oh, research. So, I know. <laughs> and, and, I know. In principle, only, you're right, but in practice, if only we had unlimited budgets and unlimited grants, wouldn't that change the world? That would be amazing. Where if the incentive structure was just tweaked a little bit so that people were encouraged yeah. to yeah check on other people's work. Uh, yeah, I'll say. So where were we? Questions. Um, uh, question for Michael. How far do you think humans go back and why do you think your scriptures can be trusted? Um, I have different reasons for trusting, you know, scriptures. I've, you know, I experienced a lot of different things as I was growing up and you know, I got exposed to a lot of different worldviews, and I became especially attracted to the worldview of ancient India. And uh, I found in the scriptures, the Puranas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, things that uh, really seemed to have some truth to them. And I'm not talking about it in an intellectual abstract sense, but uh, a more real experiential kind of truth. Uh, you know, like the idea of reincarnation. You know, I, I always kind of felt like, you know, I've been here before, I've been in this situation before, I've had previous dealings with these people. So it was, uh, uh, I think, based on having some experiential verification and validation of things that I had long sensed might be true. So it kind of gave form to that. Um, how long have humans been around according to and I'm not speaking about this in terms of scientific evidence. I'm speaking about another knowledge tradition where the testimony of uh, coming through this particular source is, is valid. But I would say uh, humans have always been around because basically there's a difference between the conscious self and the bodily vehicle that it happens to inhabit. And we're now in the human vehicle. And the universe, according to the Vedas, has a purpose. And the purpose is to allow the conscious self to either continue to take one physical vehicle after another, and including not just human births, but a whole succession of births in different kinds of bodily vehicles. But it's in the human vehicle that you can get out of that whole cycle and go to a reality where there is no birth or death or change of species. So because the universe has a purpose, I would say the human form has always been available for conscious selves in this universe. And not just this universe, because according to the Vedic cosmology, there are millions of universes that are undergoing vast cycles of 
creation and destruction, but there's a, a level of reality beyond that. So we can either stay here, stay involved in the cycle of birth and death, or we can take the advantage of the human form and use it to elevate consciousness to a state beyond birth and death. So the human form is the form in which we can do that. And I think it's always been available on this planet, other planets, other universes. Uh, it, it's always been available. All right. But that takes us a long way from what we've been talking about. Let's try to fire through these. So another one, uh, Erica had asked why modern <laughs> research is not finding the anomalies found in the 1800 reports from the 1800s. So can Michael address that, please? Uh, I'm not entirely sure that such things are not being found. Uh, I gave a couple of examples. It could be because, and this gets you back into the philosophy of science and the work of Thomas Kuhn and other scholars say that scientists tend to look for something they know and accept. If something comes to their attention that doesn't fit, then they don't see it at all, like Kuhn says that. You know, if something doesn't fit in the box, it's not seen at all for what it is. And you know, he gave the example of a famous uh, card experiment where people were shown one after another uh, the cards in a deck of cards, and they had altered, the psychologist doing the experiment had altered some of the cards. So say like if you had a six of hearts, and instead of making it red, you know, they would make it black. And, you know, they would look at the card and they'd say six of spades. It wasn't a six of spades, but, you know, that's what they were accustomed to see. So that's what they saw. They couldn't recognize the anomaly. Uh, so... I think something like that goes on. Such things are being found today, but when scientists look at it through the lens of their current paradigm, they explain it so that it fits within the paradigm. Like the example of the modern human-like finger bone. Couldn't be anatomically modern human. Absolutely couldn't be. So they don't recognize it as a, an anomaly to make it fit somehow. Uh, All right, we've got, one, by, right, we got one, one for Erica. One for Erica. JC Magruder JC is, Magruder asking, is asking, Hi, Erica, big fan. Erica. What are some of the traits that differentiate modern homo sapiens from archaic homo sapiens? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, some of the classics, I mentioned them earlier. A lot of it has to do with dentition. Um, there, you see some of this light prognathism of the dentition and some of the early archaic homo sapiens. Uh, they also lack any kind of a chin, not receding chin or anything like that. Um, you see this classic full muzzle projection that's still existing. No, no, no protuberance down here. Um, they tend to have a larger superorbital ridge. Um, they are smaller. That's another thing. Anatomically modern homo sapiens were quite large as a, as an ape in general. It, you see progressively smaller organisms as you move down the tree. Um, cranial capacity, it's about the same. Um, their limb proportions tend to be a bit more basal, although not by much. Um, and I believe there's a better precision grip with more anatomically modern. They're very slight though. These differences are not very extreme. Otherwise they wouldn't be with it, be within, um, a, a single species morphologically speaking. Um, and also the genes, that's another big one, because we can, we can actually see the genes, we can sequence the genomes of a lot of these archaic homo sapiens, uh, because it's not mineralized bone, it's true bone, the organics are still there. 
Um, that's we've actually sequenced the Neanderthal genome, which is how we know that they're 99.7% identical to humans um, and probably deserve to be within their own species. Do you want to comment on that one, Michael? Uh, there are some people in paleoanthropology who are, again, these are the multi-regional people, you know, like who included people like Richard Leakey and mm. some who said that all of these things from Habilis up through uh, uh, anatomically, so-called anatomically modern homo sapiens are one what they call evolutionary species. You know, they put them in the same species category, not different genesis. So, uh, or even different species, say Homo sapiens. The species concept is tough. Um, yeah. It's easier with genetics, but uh, even then it's still not foolproof. Um, you've, I don't know, the biological species concept is useful for explaining things, for categorizing, because humans like to categorize. We like to put things into categories. Mm -hmm. It's helpful for explaining things. Um, but can you really do it? I don't know about that. So. Uh, so someone's asking, please comment on the other Homo sapiens species living concomitantly with Homo sapiens that have larger cranial capacity. Yeah, so I touched a little bit on this earlier. Uh, contemporaneity, so this idea that you've got um, some Australopithecine species, maybe even something like Australopithecus africanus, living contemporaneously with with something like Homo erectus in South Africa. This isn't this isn't out of the question. Um, the idea that I, mean, I think this might be better with like a, a a little drawing. The idea that a species has to go extinct for a population of its of its uh, species to evolve is something of a misnomer. In fact. Quite frequently, we see the opposite. Gradualism is fine. Um, this idea of species being completely superseded by by their by their offspring or by their descendants, but more often than not, we'll see something along these lines. You might have an Australopithecine, as seen in the A, and it's minding its own business, continuing onward. Um, nothing is really going wrong, and through a climatic change of one way or another. Um, we see a branch off of it. Maybe there's a mudslide that separates the population out. And now we have the original population still persisting, and we also see uh, a branch off, a shoot off. And maybe where this branch here is living, the conditions are slightly more favorable if they have um, a more efficient bipedality. And over across where the mudslide occurred, not the case. Over time, you start to see different advantages being selected for, and you might even get additional branch offs. Like, and you end up with something like this, right? You still have that initial population and it may be more or less unchanged. It'll probably still change a little bit. So for instance, these contemporaneous uh, Australopithecines aren't going to be the same as the one that probably progenated this other group, uh, but they should be pretty similar. Um, there is absolutely nothing in evolution that states that an organism needs to go extinct for it to evolve, uh, for, its, for its descendants to evolve. Uh, and we see contemporaneity in the fossil record as well. The key is this gradient of traits, right? The key is going to be, even though we see Australopithecines still persisting, once they appear, whether or not they persist, that's not so much as important as we see, or that's not so much as important as this gradient of traits changing over time, right? If you go back to the Miocene, you're not going to see any Miocene apes that have the brain case size of an Australopithecine. That is to say, 550 cc's at maximum in a large male, perhaps. Um, but once that shows up, it sticks around. Whether or not it's in these Australopithecines, um, or whether or not it, it persists in a population that would eventually become something like Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis, um, that's not so much as important. It, once these advantageous traits appear, they tend to persist. And if they do, what they persisted from doesn't have to disappear entirely. Um, the name of the game with evolution is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So they can stick around. Contemporaneity isn't 
really an issue. Your big issue, if you really wanted to use contemporaneity to like completely disprove human evolution, it would be to find um, a, a drastic leap in brain case size before even a basic leap in brain case size had emerged. So if you found something like Homo erectus in the Miocene, that would be pretty intense. That would that would probably that would probably wreck human evolution. Uh, oh, did you want to comment yeah. on that, Michael? Yeah, just just briefly, uh, when we published Forbidden Archaeology, the idea of this linear species to species type of evolution was dominant. And you know, we proposed in that book that you do have coexistence of hominid types. Hmm. Now, it may not it may be more of the kind that uh, uh, not exactly what you know the modern view is. But I, I, I think we were kind of ahead of our time in that. You probably, I mean, that if that's what you were saying, then you were. <laughs> you yeah. Totally were. Yeah, that, that there was, that different types of hominins coexisted. It's important to, it's important to go where the data leads us. Um, that's, that's something that is not common, uh, unfortunately in um, especially older individuals in academia, because you get folks that, that ha take this opinion and they really white knuckle it. The classic example is Alan Fiducia when it comes to theropod evolution. I mean, he's the singular last holdout. Um, I don't know why. I, I think it's pretty impossible to take his position, but you know. Okay, Arjuna, I think I need to go. All right, yeah, that's fine. Cool. So thanks for that. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, be sure to subscribe. I've got Erica channel. This was so fun. Linked in the description, so you can check out her stuff too if you aren't already aware of her channel. Um, and maybe we can organize a part two and go go in deeper yeah. into a specific aspect of what we've sure. talked about today. I I would be more than happy to do a part two. Um, and and perhaps maybe on that day I'll I'll. I'll schedule. I'll schedule clear for a full three and a half hours. So if we feel like going that way, we will. No, um, two, two two hours is good. Everyone's fresh. You know, nobody's like, and yeah. yeah, anxious to get to get out. And uh, I don't know how much the audience can handle anyway. Uh, but you know, Oof, maybe yeah. maybe you guys could pick you know a couple papers or you know some more specific yeah. stuff, and you could each do your homework on the, on the points you wanted to talk about and just chat about it. Yeah, that would be really. I'd love to see that um, the 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 Toxodon paper, um, and maybe I could look. I, I, I what I need to do is purchase Forbidden Archaeology and some of your more recent books as well, because uh, all I'd read was was Hidden History, um, and I enjoyed reading it. So I'd I'd like to read some more. Um, sure. But thanks for having me. I, I really enjoyed my time here. And, and Michael, thank you for your time as well. And thank you for yours, Erica. It was a pleasure having this conversation. <laughs> People were commenting right, that, that this is a really nice kind of debate, you know, like informative, not going around in circles. So I want to yeah. thank, thank Eric again for that kind of thing. And of course, Michael Kramer. Last time we had yeah. Dr. Beckley on, it was very similar, very academic and, mm. uh, you know, people learning from each other as opposed to yeah. just trying to one up the other person like a boxing match or something. That's the goal, yeah. right? That's the goal. That's what I, I don't like the blood sports. I'm not into that. <laughs> I, I just like a, I don't know. I enjoy a good conversation. All right. Can I find my outro? Okay, cool. And we'll tune out here. Hare Krishna. <laughs>